right, welcome everyone for the CSE's eSports in the Capital Markets uh, panel discussion. We've got a great program. We're going to talk about some great issues um, regarding eSports and gaming. And really, I think we should talk about definitions as well for everyone. So uh, very excited that we have uh, three amazing CEOs who have companies, eSports and gaming companies that are currently listed on the Canadian Securities Exchange. Um, Matthew Schmidt. Uh, Kevin Wright and Matt Bailey, you guys want to wave? Welcome, everyone. Great to hey, have thanks you. Thanks for having us, Dan. Yeah, uh, why don't we just go around? Um, I'd love for you guys maybe just give a quick introduction, uh, who you are, your company, and then we'll get right into it. So, um, Matthew Schmidt, do you want to kick things off? Sure. Yeah. Thanks so much for having us, Dan, and excited to be here chatting with all these great minds. Um, so, I'm the CEO of Alpha Esports Tech, our ticker is ALPA. Um, in a nutshell, we really focus on amateur and emerging gamers. Our core platform is a platform called Gamers Arena, spelled with a Z. Um, my background, I come from film and media and entertainment, and um, I'm having a lot of fun kind of connecting the dots between brands and organizations that want to reach younger demographics and kind of meet them where they already are. And it's been really exciting to be in a space that's evolving and changing so quickly. It's growing rapidly. And, uh, you know, we're, we're learning a lot and having a lot of fun building as we go. Awesome. Thanks so much. I'm going to go, uh, Kevin. Uh, thanks, Ben. How are you doing? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Kevin Wright. I'm the president of uh, Game Square Esports with GSQ on the CSE. Uh, we are effectively a digital media company. So we're, we're doing the connecting of brands and fans. Uh, through digital uh, media groups, through a talent agency that we operate in the UK. And we just recently acquired Complexity Gaming uh, in, uh, in Texas, uh, which is a massive uh, media collection and, and top tier teams uh, that, uh, that reach all around the world. Awesome. Thank you so much. And finally, Matt Bailey. Hey guys, I'm, I'm Matt Bailey, CEO of Game On Entertainment Technology, just recently listed on the CSE about a month ago under the ticker GET. Uh, and we work with content providers, so that's teams, leagues, TV networks, work sports books and esports organizations, and make their content more engaging and social through predictive gaming. So we're a white label platform that programmatically creates predictive gaming experiences around our partners' content. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, I get the feeling, do you have, do you guys already know each other? Have you guys chatted before? Uh, no, right. no not yet. No, this is the first time because, like, as you guys are telling me about your companies, like, I, I'm already hearing so many synergies. So, at the very least, this is awesome uh, for no other reason that you guys should get together and talk and chat. Mm -hmm. um, does someone want to take a stab at when we talk about just definitions and understanding the terms? There's esports, which is well, I'll let you guys define it, and there's gaming, which you know, gaming does include a lot of things. Um, can you? Give a good definition for the everyday investor and what the difference is between the two. Well, for me, I, I mean, you know, I really look at gaming as the macro industry and esports as one silo of that. And, you know, for a while we saw it being a, a popular kind of buzzword in, in investing um, because it felt new to a lot of people when you saw these big stadiums, even pre-COVID, get sold out for these events. But these um, communities had been percolating on the fringes for some time now, and, and it was cool to see it come to light. But as an industry, there's so many other verticals, just like if you were to say, you know, media or music or film, there's so many other different verticals um, within there and, and competitive gaming, not just for pros, but um, online and more lifestyle gamers. So I really describe it as esports being one vertical of competitive high stakes gaming within the gaming industry as a whole. I don't know if you guys would add to that, Kevin or Matt. Yeah, I mean, I think um, from my standpoint, we're, we're a B2B uh, organization and we're primarily looking at, at we're servicing the, the B2B space and, and partners. Uh, I think, yeah, gaming is, is overall the category that, that we're going after, one of the categories and verticals that we're servicing and, and esports is, is one of them under that. Um, and then outside of that, we're in traditional sports and other parts, uh, other categories as well. But yeah, I agree with with Matthew and what he said, and I, I see it as overall gaming and esports being one of them. Yeah, and I, I think esports is, is shifting and evolving in and itself too, um, uh, which is interesting. Just from you know these pro player pro players, if you will, 
Um, and then now what we're seeing is a lot of lifestyle players that are, that are it takes the same amount of time. They're streaming so much. Um, and we're seeing a lot of pro players. You're going to have to pick one or the other. But, you know, even players like Ninja or, or these other players are shifting to being lifestyle players. They're still making a living. They're working with brands and sponsors instead of playing these large um, um, high stakes tournaments with bigger prize pools. And the lifestyle gamers, if you will, it kind of reminds me a lot of just influencers, which we've seen across other industries and, and other digital platforms. Um, but the influence they're having and the engagement of these fans watching them is unprecedented for me. Um, and, and I feel like it's just getting started. Yeah. And, and awesome. another thing is we, I, I, what I mentioned is I kind of bucketed sports outside in a different category, but we're actually seeing them blend together as well. Uh, traditional sports with esports. And what we used to call an athlete is changing as well uh, because totally. these esports uh, competitors, they are athletes. Um, totally. You know, mentally. Yeah, totally. So yeah, it's, uh, the question was kind of asking to, to clearly kind of define the two, but they're actually, they actually blend over quite a bit um, and we're probably going to see more of an evolution over the coming years. Yeah, totally. Kevin, Kevin I want to ask you, um, you know, when Forbes values sports franchises, they include things like ticket sales, merchandise, and things like that. From what I've looked at with, with New Zoo stats, when they're valuing and deciding on esports revenue, they're le- leaving out merch and a, a lot of sort of ancillary items that, let's say, for complexity is only driven because of their esports. So do you feel kind of the esports industry and that $1 billion number that's thrown around doesn't really reflect um, some of the other sources of revenue that, yes, maybe are not direct, but are clearly part of the picture? Yeah, they, they have to be part of the picture. And, and so when we looked at complexity, what we like is they're a, they're a top tier world class uh, org. Uh, their CSGO team is top 10 in the world. Um, and what that does is it gives them the credibility, the, the, the respect of fans in the industry um, that drives, I mean, one, an ability to create a ton of content. And they're, they're about to, uh, to kick off the Race to World First event, uh, which is, you know, two weeks of uh, content created by complexity, it's going to do more than the Overwatch League did across all the teams uh, in an entire season. And so it's building that content, which then is attracting the eyeballs. And then it's all the pieces around that. It's branded content that you can create for sponsors. It's the merchandise that you can create. Yeah, it's the events that you run. It's uh, it's it's the sponsorships. It's it's this whole ecosystem of pieces that are available, and I think that's what's interesting with esports is that we're entering this era of professionalization where it's moving mm-hmm. from just being a top tier team, uh, really focusing on training those athletes, like Matt talked about, into how do we actually monetize this now, and how do we take this great content. And, and drive those dollars uh, into the esports uh, uh, industry. Totally. Awesome. And, and I look at it as like, where does that content live? And, and at times it can feel really fragmented, but it's kind of finding itself. And there's a great roadmap from conventional sports and looking at that. And that was a really interesting question, Ben. But it's also different in a sense that like, if you look at, um, you know, nobody owns football, but the NFL is the most reputable league. Whereas in esports, we have these publishers who own the IP of the game. Um, which in and itself is a little different when those macro numbers are thrown around. Um, but I, but I still think there's so many different parallels to just video games being the new social media and, and how we're now connecting with Gen X, Y, and Z, um, is, is really interesting. Yeah, no, thanks. So in conclusion, it's complicated. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to transition for a second. It's, I'm glad you brought up, you know, monetization and revenue. Um, can you guys go through within your own companies, you know, and, and again, try to break it down for the simple investor. Um, you know, how do you guys make money uh, personally as a company and, and maybe talk about what those verticals are? Uh, maybe we'll start with Matt, uh, Matt Bailey. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we given again, we're B2B uh, and we're providing you know, technology solutions to our partners uh, we have two two uh, revenue streams or a two prong monetization model. The first is licensing revenue, so you know it's similar to a SaaS fee. It's recurring revenue uh, they pay to license our technology, and then the second is a revenue share. So all of the things we mentioned uh, or what were just mentioned, so sponsorships, maybe programmatic ad revenue, the sales of uh, merchandise or collectibles or NFTs or, or whatever it might be. 
Um, if our partner is doing that via our technology, we'll participate and share in that upside as well. So there are two ways that, that we generate revenue. Awesome. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, Kevin, what about you? Yeah. So uh, like I said, we, we operate digital uh, media group. We uh, operate a talent agency. Both of those are similar. We, we sit in between the brands and the big esports audience. So we're, we're uh, connecting up influencers in the UK uh, with brands who then authentically uh, uh, showcase those products and services to, to the people that follow them. Uh, we take care of all the business needs for those influencers from the legal side, collections, uh, reporting for the, uh, uh, for the advertisers. And we've got a really healthy consulting business there. On this side of the Atlantic, uh, we have a digital media group uh, that you know, provides bespoke activations for, uh, for brands that are trying to figure out how do we reach uh, this, this massive, growing, important demographic that likes esports. So again, we're getting paid for the IP of how to create these activations. And then when we move over to the complexity side of uh, owning an esports org, you know, there the way that we monetize is, you know, branded sponsorships for uh, uh, one, the facilities that we operate in, it's logos on the uh, uh, on the jerseys. But more importantly, it's, you know, how do we connect up brands with really interesting content uh, creation? Uh, and then that extends to the agency of record agreement that we have with the Dallas Cowboys for their gaming and esports. And so it's helping them understand how do we connect up this massive esports audience to conventional and traditional sports, uh, because there are a lot of people that uh, can be interested in the NFL that just might not be there yet. And our job is to bring those eyeballs. Awesome. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. I'm definitely hearing, and, and you know, sponsorship being, you know, Last I've heard, 60%, 70% of the industry. So it seems um, like that's that's holding true. And uh, Matthew, what about you? What about your company? Yeah, totally. So <clears throat> our core asset, Gamers Arena, that I talked about, focuses on amateur and emerging gamers, and it's a cross-platform tournament. So it doesn't matter what title you're playing or what, um, you know, if you're playing on an Xbox, PS5, your PC, you're going to meet and connect with different players and compete in tournaments for prize pools. And again, like, you know, looking at the numbers, over 2.7 billion people are playing video games and 75,000 pro players. So there's this whole other segment of people that want to compete uh, competitively and, and meet each other and kind of find those communities and scrim. So the, the tech itself, we can onboard a bunch of people, whether it's a bracket or a leaderboard format and administer different prizes throughout that. So there's a few different revenue verticals in there. Uh, one of the main ones is a monthly subscription service. For this, players are getting access to bigger and better uh, prizing and tournaments. They're getting stats and analytics, which kind of leads to coaching and scouting. And we're doing a lot of stuff with up and coming schools and a kind of discovery engine with colleges and universities, which is a very big fragmented part of our industry right now. So the monthly subscription is it's how we're buying movies right now. It's how we're buying music. Um, uh, we really like that, that model there. Skill-based challenges is another big one that we're working on right now. So this is just head-to-head, peer-to-peer skill-based challenges. So Ben, if you and I challenge each other to a game and I wagered you $10, winner takes nine, house takes a 10% clip. This is very similar to a company called Skills, S-K-I-L-L-Z. Um, and then also our B2B stuff. So the same tech we have to onboard a vast amount of users and organize these different tournaments, but also to spit out the information on there, to give them one unique dashboard Brands and organizations are really interested in this. And for me, this is a very fast way to drive user growth. It's through these larger partnerships with organizations, companies, professional sports teams that we're already working with, and colleges and universities, and kind of becoming the gold standard of amateur and emerging gamers and ranking. But these are also services that these brands and organizations will pay for monthly, and what we're calling gas, just to play on SaaS, gaming as a service. Um, to really give them stats and analytics on their user base. Because, you know, the, the smarter organizations are paying attention and they want to meet their younger fan base where they're already spending their time and it's gaming, it's here. Right. Um, right. So giving them their own social communities and rather than us really have to, to, to build up and drive the Gamers Arena brand, which we're already doing and it's growing organically and we're really happy with that, white labeling that to have these other largest, like globally recognized brands and to power their esports organizations online and their social communities. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so I hope that, you know, kind of summarizes some of the, you know, revenue streams, whether it's, you know, a B2B SaaS model, whether it's a B2C subscription model, uh, or whether it's brand partnerships, there's many different ways, you know, for people to monetize within this industry. 
Um, to switch gears for a second, you know, you guys are part of a pretty uh, elite and exclusive club. There's only maybe 20 esports and gaming companies, not including game developers game developers or publishers that are publicly traded in North America. So really people look to you guys in terms of the trends, what's going to be big, what's, you know, what's happening next. So I um, want to know, what do you guys think? Maybe just if you could say two parts, and again, just really quickly, um, where does, where do you as a company want to go, uh, let's say in the next 12 months, uh, and maybe some more macro trends of where do you think the industry going? I know that's a really broad question, but I want to leave it to you guys to, to give me your impact. Um, your input. So, uh, Matthew, maybe we'll start with you. Bailey? Matthew Schmidt. Or, or, oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, yeah. We have totally. Matt and Matthew. That's how I'm making yeah. the. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I think it's a great question. I, you know, I, I've always felt coming into this industry as as the you know the technology is like a decade ahead of everything else that we're seeing, but I've always felt like the branding and the biz dev is a decade behind, and it's still kind of playing catch up. And the way these brands are integrating with these communities. Um, you know, looking at Gen Z's right now, they're going to account for 40% of the global consuming this year, spending power of over $150 billion, you know, eight to 24 year olds, the way these people communicate, shop, share, connect and find these communities. Um, they're very obsessed with authentic and transparent experiences, but I think the way brands interact with them is changing and the smart ones are paying attention. So rather than just a logo or a pop-up ad, or I have to watch this for this many seconds till I can skip, it, instead of annoying them, we're really trying to look at finding ways where we can add value back to them and they get something from that. So, you know, I think the, where the industry is going with how brands add value back to the gamers and the end users, um, I think that's going to be a big trend. Just offering those kind of customized interactive brand experiences, as well as commercial placements, but placements that make sense and are authentic to, to the gaming experience. And then the data and analytics and, and sponsorship evaluations within that. Um, and also big trends that we're paying close attention to is mobile. Um, we got a lot of stuff in the pipeline with mobile and um, uh, AR mobile working with existing brand IP. Um, and uh, you know, we're, we're a young company. We've only been listed for about three months, but we're looking at some really exciting M&A opportunities. To, to drive user growth and find things that can kind of cross pollinate value amongst the, the portfolio and team is, is really what we're focused on is, is just bringing together great minds from other industries, as well as this industry to kind of solve these problems and, and offer these communities great experiences. Awesome. Appreciate that. Great insight um, for, for this coming year. Um, let's take it to Kevin. What about you guys? What's next for you in the next 12 months and, and the industry? Yeah, so for us, it's continuing to build up the relationships uh, with brands that are trying to enter into uh, esports, and and exactly what Matthew just talked about, it's the it's it's that authenticity uh, for brands and and how do they reach them? And so we're partnering up with uh, uh, with end sites. We're partnering up with technology solutions. So a really creative, innovative uh, solution that we partnered up recently. Uh, it monitors what people are saying about brands. And so it's it's really taking that understanding and helping brands to, to know what's being said about them and how to uh, uh, customize your message for that. And, you know, it comes to brand safety, it comes to awareness, and it's it's all these things that brands are expecting from other industries, but aren't necessarily getting within esports. And so, you know, the the biz dev and, and marketing side catching up, I think that, that really resonates. Uh, and then for us more broadly, I mean, yeah, we're chasing after uh, brands that are in the market and convincing new ones to come in. But we think on the macro side, more and more brands are spending more and more money because they're seeing good ROI come out of these. Um, and I also think that the the, the M&A uh, trend is going to continue. So, you know, we're, we're trending towards $28 million in revenue for 2022. Uh, and you know, a good chunk of that's built on the M&A that we've done. Uh, with a lot of uh, organic growth. I think there's so much opportunity coming for consolidation within this industry, uh, where it's Agreed. smart uh, smart acquisitions that are not just on the revenue side, but really driving towards uh, the cash flow generation in the, uh, in the, in the coming months. Nice. Yeah, I noticed when you put that out, it's very rare that esports companies um, put out kind of any type of forward guidance. So 
Um, I thought that was really, really, I'm going to say ballsy that you guys did that. Um, but I think it sets the right, right expectation. Like there should be a little bit more continuity uh, for investors looking at different companies. We're drawing a line in the sand, uh, showing how we have that build up with our portfolio of companies. Uh, and we're not forecasting out like, you know, triple digit growth. These are, these are low to mid double digit growth for, uh, for our portfolio companies. And I think that's really achievable within esports. Yeah, no, for sure. Okay, uh, Matt Bailey, what about you guys? What's next for you and uh, some of the trends? I think what's what's really important and a trend that we're going to see, or we are seeing to an extent now, uh, in gaming, especially in esports and sports betting, where the where there are these kind of um, passionate audiences, but they're quite niche, but they're looking to expand to, and become more mainstream. I think education is going to be really important. So products that don't just expect the North American audience to understand and be able to make a bet or be able to, you know, play play esports, but actually it helps them in becoming educated to do so. I think that's going to be really important. We're trying to help our partners do that uh, on the predictive gaming side. And then uh, the other that, that we're really focused on is innovation. So again, using predictive gaming as an example, we don't want to just keep pushing out, you know, turnkey, uh, you know, predict, prediction games and just stop at that. We want to be innovative in what we're serving to our partners. And ex an example is we just announced an NFT predictor uh, where you're using collectibles as pieces, as a utility in a prediction game. And we're taking that to our partners like teams, leagues, TV networks, tournaments, um, and it's being responded to really well. Um, we're not a blockchain company. We're not an NFT company. We're just gamifying that. Um, and that's an example of what we'll continue doing is coming out with innovative products that are first of its kind that haven't been done before, um, kind of taking big swings at, at spaces and products that haven't been pushed out before. So that's what we'll be focusing on. And then I'll, I'll double down on what Matthew said with team. I think team's everything. Um, Game On continues to, to hire and, and expand our team in key leadership roles that are going to help us expand, drive partnerships and drive revenue. Uh, I got excited for a second. I thought you were going to say, I'm going to double down and give you our 2020 revenue forecasts as well. <laughs> uh, but no, it's all good. Um, just to kind of wear the investor hat a little bit, you know, there is, and I think I think we'd probably agree, there's a lot of volatility in, you know, for esports companies that are publicly traded. Could be that a lot of them are small caps, could be because of COVID. Um, what are kind of some of the risk factors um, that you guys could identify for investors who are thinking, I want to get into esports and gaming. I want to have it as part of my portfolio, but I'm not the type of investor that's you know shooting for the moon uh, and, and and swinging for a home run. So uh, maybe you can just lay out a couple couple risk factors risk, risk factors you think investors should look at. Um, Kevin, why don't you start us off? To, to me, I think what people need to look at is what's the quality of the revenue and what's the long term. Uh, uh, profitability uh, and and how do companies get to it? And so uh, I think there's a lot of companies right now on on big juicy uh, sales multiples, uh, but you know at some point that needs to turn into cash flow. And and you know for for both the guys that are on this call, they're they're tech platforms, so there's lots of runway uh, to sort of own the world as you uh, as you add those uh, those customers. But I think you know, non-tech based uh, companies that don't have a path to profitability. I, I think that's a risk that investors need to really understand is uh, how is this company going to be a cash flowing company that's worth a lot in, you know, whether it's three years or five years or 10 years, we need to see that path. Yeah. Well, and, that and correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think there's one single publicly traded esports or gaming company, again, not including game publishers that's eat that that's got positive EBITDA, right? Yeah, I, unless I don't you think, can think of one that I can't. Yeah, I don't. I don't think there are, uh, and that's why we keep uh, we keep drilling in that on the M and A pipeline that we're doing. We continue to look at companies that are operating in that you know, twenty to fifty percent EBITDA margin as a uh, as a way to accelerate getting to that profitability. Yeah, awesome. Um, let's go to uh, Matthew Schmidt. Uh, what do you think? Some yeah, of the risk factors. I, I, I think, Kevin, uh, there's some really great insights there. I mean, you know, if I'm looking at it from a retail perspective, you know, I'm, I'm betting on the team uh, because because this space is, is evolving so quickly and changing so quickly. Um, and a lot of tech platforms like Game On and ourselves, um, you know, we have a lot of these blue sky elements, but, but spreading it out and being able to be nimble enough to adapt and drill into what's working um, and, and really 
adapt and, and focus on, you know, where the market's going. Because unlike being a publisher and making a game where these runways that are so long to bring that game to market, um, you know, we need to be able to change on, on the drop of a hat sometimes and, and adapt in. You know, and if I look at it from, you know, earlier publicly traded companies, a lot of them have pivoted what they originally set out to do. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I look at enthusiasts in the early days and what they originally were and with their team. And now, you know, becoming more of this TSN, ESPN for, of esports. And, and, you know, you get these macro numbers of how many eyeballs and this. And I think it's really great for the space. So when I look at these smaller, younger ones, I really think, okay, who's the team? You know, what have they worked on? And do they have some really good guidance there? To, to kind of, you know, you know, and, and I've been really lucky to have our, our chairman, Jonathan Anastas, has been a great kind of guiding force on, on that side for me and kind of balanced us out. Um, he was a global head of, of digital at Activision. You know, that company saw a 10x in value over his tenure. He's now the CMO of One Esports. They've raised over 400 million bucks, over a billion dollar market cap. And, you know, the conversations I have with him are really what are the trends? Where is this space going? And, and what has the most white space for us? And then through M&A and, and um, you know, purchasing other bits of technology and teams, can we get exposure to these spaces? And then we're going to see where that goes and, and what works there. So, I mean, in, in a nutshell, um, you know, if it's a smaller company, I'm looking at the team. Uh, if it's a larger company, I'm, I'm drilling down on actual active users and, and revenue and EBITDA and fundamentals. Awesome. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Uh, and let's, uh, yeah, Matt Bailey, some final um, thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, the risk that, that I would look at if, if I was an investor, I still think um, COVID is still a risk. In North America, we're looking better, but you know, Australia just went into lockdown. Um, Japan, no, no one's going to the, the Olympics. India is still doing it pretty tough. So from a sports standpoint, I think there's still that risk of, of certain, especially traditional sports, not, not happening. We've tried to mitigate against that through not just helping our partners in sports, but also reality, TV, news, elections. We worked with NBC Universal and Bravo late last year on a prediction game for the Real Housewives, and that's now a significant part of our business. So that's how we've mitigated and what, to what Matthew said, be nimble and, and actually ride the wave and go where the opportunities you know, might be presenting themselves. Um, so so that's, that's the main one uh, that I would point out. Uh, but yeah, again, I think you know, you're, you're betting on, with these small companies, you're betting on team, you're betting on the people around them that are helping drive the business each and every day. Awesome. So uh, you know, just, just some final thoughts, because you know, this is about you know, esports and the capital markets. Um, there's been a lot of companies, even the past couple of months that have gone public, whether it's you know, under gaming, I th- and I think you guys, right? Game on. You were the last one, most recent, the newest kid on the block. Um, Overactive Media is, is trading on Thursday. And, you know, there's a big pipeline of others coming. Um, do you still see, um, is this just still a good time for raising capital? Um, or is there a bit of a correction in valuations um, from just your own experiences running your companies and raising money? Uh, where would you kind of rate the market in terms of um, raising capital and valuations? Um, Kevin, you can kick things off. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in because we, we just uh, completed a, a raise. We haven't even closed it yet, but uh, you know, we did two private placements. One was the, the Jerry Jones uh, family office uh, from the Dallas Cowboys and the Goss put in seven, and seven million US or eight and a half uh, Canadian as part of the complexity deal. But then on top of that, we raised another eight and a half uh, million uh, Canadian among institutions in uh, in Canada. And so you know, it, it wasn't easy, but uh, I think we, we got pretty good support. Uh, there's always some volatility, always going to a raise, a little worried about how it's going to go. But we were we were fully subscribed on a on a bought deal before before it was even announced. So I think it's still healthy. Um, I think that there are still a number of companies that will come to market. And I think that investors are starting to wrap their head around this is an investable space. And so they're willing to make kind of small bets in companies uh, that are up and coming, give them a little bit of runway to uh, to do their thing, show what they're doing, uh, and then I think we've been we've been fortunate because now we're able to talk about you know the, the the outlook that we have, and so we're making that migration from large retail investors to you know th- that important uh, institutional side. And so I was really pleased that more institutions are are paying attention, and I think that's also off the back of a really successful story and enthusiast, um, which I think is. Uh, is a great bellwether for all of us 
uh, to point totally. to of what can companies become in this space. Totally. Well said, and congrats on that raise, Kevin. Um, yeah, you know, just to add to that, I think Enthusiast has been a great kind of leader of the pack, and, and I think a lot of um, institutions and family offices are tar- starting to take the space more serious. Um, you know, we, we did our, our private placement raise before we went public. We were oversubscribed. It, it went really well for us. And I, what I found is a lot of people just wanted exposure to the space, and they didn't fully understand it yet. And, and you know, we really invited them to just look at the team, look at, look at what we're attacking in the white space. Um, and you know, we're, I feel like we're just getting warmed up and, uh, and looking forward to building it out. Awesome. And, and to, to wrap that up, I, I agree. Um, uh, we also did a pre pre IPO private placement went really well, closed it, you know, within a week or so. Uh, and I can speak more to like predictive gaming and sports betting. Uh, like we're hundred percent just in the first innings with that in North America, there, there aren't many opportunities in a lifetime where you can say North America will be the biggest market for this without a doubt because it's uh, just you know, hasn't been legal there's been some regulatory hurdles which that's a that's another risk uh, to keep in mind like the regulatory landscape could play a part um, but yeah we're just in the first innings for, for predictive gaming and sports betting in the US and you can see that I'm oh, sorry North America and you can see that from you know the the roll ups and the the acquisitions and the the financings that are happening you know almost on a daily basis I'm seeing it. Mm-hmm. I think we're going to see a lot more consolidation for sure. Yeah, if we had more time, I'd love to also talk about M and A. That's a really huge part of the industry as well. Uh, I feel like every day there's a new ac- no, I'm not. I don't think there is every day there's a new acquisition. Um, Definitely. So um, that was awesome, guys. I really appreciate that. I think I think you guys gave you know everyone watching a pretty good uh, grasp of what's going on in the industry, some of the trends and things like that. Uh, maybe just end off um, kind of where people can get a hold of you, how to find you, and uh, your stock ticker. Okay. Yeah. So again, our company is Alpha Esports Tech. Our ticker is A L P A on the Canadian Exchange. Uh, myself, Matthew B. Schmidt on LinkedIn. Um, and, uh, yeah, look forward to following, uh, these guys. It's been great chatting with you, Kevin and Matt, and, uh, hopefully you guys keep an eye on us and we got some really exciting stuff in the pipeline. Thanks a lot. Matt, uh, Bailey. Yeah. Matt Bailey, CEO at Game On Entertainment Technologies. Ticker is G E T. Um, you know, reach out to me anytime, Matt at gameon.app, A-P-P, or check out our website, gameon.app. Right. And Kevin Wright. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Wright, president, Game Square. So uh, tickers, GSQ on the uh, Canadian Securities Exchange. Uh, on social, we're, I think, across the board, GSQ Esports. Uh, so you can find us there. And then uh, reach out to us at ir at uh, gamesquare.com. Uh, and we will promptly reply. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I'm Ben Pfefferman. Um, moderating this panel uh, from Amuka Esports. I just want to thank everyone for tuning in. I also want to thank uh, Philip Schum and everyone from the CSC for putting together this great event. I think the more we can educate investors, uh, the better it is for the industry. So thank you so much for that. And um, hope everyone enjoyed the program.